I want to dish this out in five uh, parts to you. A little bit about the institutional background of the responsible research and innovation um, initiatives that are, uh, are running right now in, in Europe and um, uh, around the world. Um, some recent Dutch examples uh, of responsible research and innovation. Um, two topics and items that I think are very important in getting a better understanding of what the distinctive features of responsible research and innovation are compared to all the reflection that is already out there on the ethical and legal and social aspects of technologies and innovation. I think there is, there is a distinctive element there that we need to uh, focus on in order to make good use of this new vehicle, conceptual vehicle. <clears throat> um, so that's three and four. And uh, I want to close off with uh, some remarks on the conception of responsibility that I think we need to help ourselves to in order to capitalize over this new and exciting development. Um, so we all know this and we're all excited and probably many of you are all working uh, to get, grab some of this 80 billion uh, and there is some 500 million reserved for research that is geared towards in general towards the grand challenges that we have in Europe have agreed upon that we would um, um, f put in center stage. Um, and we all know these, what these challenges are and some of them uh, are we are already working on. Um, so that's what the Innovation Union in Europe is all about. Uh, we think responsibility is important and we've just learned uh, yesterday from our uh, keynote speaker from the US that um, in, in the US they're also thinking that responsibility and you've uh, focused that on big data debates but it's, it's happening everywhere. But um, I think um, in all modesty we can say that Europe has an interesting position because we, we are used to putting uh, values and responsibility center stage. Um, even to, to the extent that the unit within DG Research that deals with uh, these issues has changed its name from uh, the unit that was dealing with science and society to uh, later on dealt with science in society and now it's even more complex than this, uh, this uh, indicates it's science for and with society to indicate that this that is really getting closer to where the action is uh, and as it says here some uh, kind of roughly calculated 500 million euros are available to deal with these um, ballpark area these these kind of issues um, I've had the honor of, of uh, chairing a, a, a working group or expert group uh, that has produced this report um, and I will come back to some of the uh, uh, definitions and some of the characterizations of, of responsible research and innovation that are in this uh, document. Um, it was also good to see that um, in Europe there's a clear understanding and, and, and that's a feather in the cap of the, the Dutch Research Council that was very forward thinking already in, in 2003 to start up um, a responsible research and innovation program here in the Netherlands and we're seeing these conferences now coming out as a result of that forward thinking. Um, so that was, uh, I've, I've consulted my calendar and uh, I, I attended one of the first meetings that was, uh, were, was organized by the Dutch Research Council. I remember quite well because I was a visiting professor in Canberra and I came back uh, from Canberra to attend that meeting uh, amongst some other things that I... Um, the reason why I think this is uh, sitting so comfortably in the Netherlands uh, and, it, and, it, and it catches on here easily is because of an, a number of historical uh, uh, developments that, are, uh, that we have here. We have a very, very strong, internationally uh, strong uh, science and technology studies community and of course we know all the names and all the people that have been I've just listed a number of them here but you know uh, it's not an exhaustive listing uh, that these people are actually the the builders among the builders of this of this of this uh, this type of research Ari Rip, Wiebe Beiker, Jose van Eindhoven, Annemarie Mol, Nelly Oudshoorn here in the audience welcome <laughs> um, but also a very strong ethics and technology um, community very applied stuff and the three TU Ethics Center is a uh, consolidation of, of those efforts. Um, and then also technology assessment has always had a, a, a lot of traction here in the Netherlands and we have the Rathenau Institute which is still uh, a very, uh, very strong and active group um, feeding the, uh, the public debate with reports and, and, and very good publications. 
that fuel those debates and structure them. And, um, and then in addition to all of this, uh, we have a, an excellent group of, of historians of technology. Uh, Harry Linsen and Johan Schott were, were uh, among the defining and the people of, the, of this field. Johan Schott recently moved to Spru, uh, Spru in, uh, in the UK. Um, and then law and technology. Hans Franken, um, he started, um, I think, a decade ago, also very forward-looking, uh, uh, a large NBO pro uh, program, Dutch Research Council program, in the IT, IT and law, and that also uh, uh, drew a lot of attention. Um, and the other thing is public administration and technology. So our, our people working in public administration were already in the late nine, uh, 1990s working on um, IT and how it would affect public administration. And so also a lot of scholars coming out of that group uh, shared between Leiden, Tilburg and, um, and Rotterdam. So a very fertile soil for these initiatives to, to, be, uh, to be in. Um, so let's look at a couple of Dutch, to keep it a little bit Dutch for this occasion here in The Hague, recent examples of responsible research and innovation that just um, may um, catch your imagination. We have a Dutch Fairphone and it's, uh, it has all kinds of nice features. It has the same functionality as every other phone, um, but it is, uh, the, uh, the materials are not from areas that are uh, uh, subject to um, uh, human rights violations and conflicts. Uh, they are from areas uh, where, where it's all safe and nice. People get paid well for putting them together. Um, so in all respects, they've tried to do a good job on this phone. It is slightly more expensive, but not really outrageously more expensive. Um, this is a, um, I've, uh, this has drawn my attention because my wife has, uh, has asked me a couple of times to, to bring a package with, um, clothes she bought on the internet back to the, the post office, office because it didn't fit or she didn't like it. Um, and that has happened already twice and I can see how that, easily see how that could happen more in the future. But this, this turns out to be a problem. Um, so people are ordering things, the uh, uh, internet commerce is, is, is booming. People are ordering stuff all the time but they also want to be able to send it back. So we have a lot of more of logistics going and especially clothing. Now what these people have done is actually you can do a body scan, 3D body scan, so you, you create a virtual mannequin and then you can uh, go to sites where you can try this on, on your virtual kind of body, right? <laughs> to see whether, I don't know whether it's perfect, but the idea is very neat. Uh, and of course, the CO2 reduction, energy saving, and cutting down on, on logistics is, I think, very, uh, very interesting. There are some more fundamental science uh, in the colleagues from Eindhoven. Uh, this is uh, the youngest female professor that we had in the Netherlands, Maike Kroon. Um, and she came up with a, what the, um, all the experts say is an absolute game changer in the uh, paper uh, industry and carton industry. Uh, she has found a way um, of, of getting to cellulose from waste bio-based materials to paper and, and produce carton. Um, which is 40% more efficient and has all kinds of miraculous properties. So it's, it's a real, it's a no brain, it's, it's wonderful. It's, uh, it's, it's going to change at least a part of the world. Um, uh, this is a study that we've done, we have, uh, as I pointed out already, we have a lot, of, a lot of water. And this is a very neat um, study for the Grevelingen. So it is tidal energy, but it does other things as well. It is, it is it's a sophisticated management uh, system of the ecosystem because there is brackish water, sweet and salt water, and you need to do the right mix. Uh, and it's at the same time a very adequate flood defense. So you have three functionalities imposed upon one object. So all the three in one fell swoop. You know, three things that you need to do, you desperately want to do, and you're combining them into one. This is our former prime minister, uh, Ruud Lubbers, and he gave an innovation award to this idea, uh, and it's the same thing as the previous slide, um, we have churches in the Netherlands, uh, beautiful churches, but they're no longer used for religious ceremonies, but for conferences like this one. Um, and then you need, to, um, you need to heat those buildings because you're running a conference there. Um, um, but you, the basement is very cold. You could use that as a cooling thing. So you put data uh, bases or servers in the basement 
uh, and then you benefit from the cooling. Uh, and at the same time, you use the hot air to warm the church, warm up the church. Um, really interesting. Uh, sometimes it goes wrong. Uh, <laughs> and we've tried this, and this is a sustainable bus, but it, is, it was optimized on sustainability to make it very, very light. It was on, on liquid gas, and it exploded. It was here also very close to The Hague, Wassenaar, where this, this went wrong. So uh, you see what can go wrong if you, if, you, if you have one value in your mind, so it's sustainability, and you forget about safety, then we're off to a bad start, right? So we, we don't want that. Uh, so, yeah, we're in this situation of value pluralism. We have all of those values, and we are non-relativist, we're assuming for a moment, with respect to those values, that, so we take them really serious, and, and every time there is a conflict, we don't start automatically to relativize, and so on, it's not really, uh, doesn't matter uh, really. Uh, other people think uh, otherwise, so why make, make a fuss? So privacy, autonomy, equity, justice, dignity, well-being and happiness, safety, security, sustainability, health, friendship, solidarity, and uh, slightly more kind of specific values that could pertain to infrastructures like dependability or usability or resilience or reliability or uh, ought statements can be derived from these values. So you say, well, we ought to do this and that with respect to if we want to safeguard or when, uh, when we want to have resilience, right? So they're normative. And there can be real conflicts and dilemmas between them. So this leads to what we have called moral overload. We want all of these things, right? We all want them at the same time. And now we feel overburdened. We feel morally overloaded. How, dignity and, and privacy and this and that and the other, right? And I'll give you some examples. Um, so we can be really in a difficult situation. I've used this example uh, before, but that's still um, two examples that, that make clear what, what the problem is that we are confronted with. Um, smart meters, these things. We also have a project on that. Smart meters. Uh, we have to smartify the electricity grid in order to make it more efficient and to reach our CO2 reduction targets in 2020. Um, it's, it's a no-brainer. We have to do that. We can, um, we, we can do that very well. And everyone was ready to roll in the Netherlands uh, to do that. Uh, and this thing was already developed and was called a smart meter. But then we started, to re we started to realize that this was a little kind of spying device um, that takes a snapshot of the electricity consumption in your household and sends it off to a database of the electricity company. Um, and then people started to protest and say, well, probably not a good idea. So no smart meter. After 10 years of research, everyone was ready to roll. We would indeed reach our CO2 reduction targets. It was a missed opportunity. Back to square one. Very stupid. Um, so engineers were claiming that they did a smart meter. Well, uh, my suggestion is they could have done a much better job if they would have had um, those privacy requirements on the table up front when they were still designing this and they had an opportunity to make this apart from more efficient, uh, the more efficient management of the electricity, also privacy respecting. But in order to do that, you need to be articulate with your values, at, uh, with respect to your values at the right moment, when you can still make a difference. Right? So we need to train our engineers to think along these lines in order to prevent these kind of uh, terrible um, hiccups. Another one, uh, 300 million, according to a recent study, uh, wasted uh, because, again, the upper house decided not to go forward with the electronic patient record system. Um, and same thing, privacy considerations. I've talked to those people 10 years ago who, who did this system, uh, and they said, well, they, they, they said, well, we've covered all of the, the issues, but they're not really taking it serious. And they should have done a better job. Then they could have inserted all kinds of privacy-respecting elements in into that uh, technology. Um, so we, this is the structure of the problem. We want sustainability and we want privacy, or we want security and privacy. Right? Um, so we are morally overloaded. We want our security above a certain threshold level and we want our privacy above a certain threshold level. And therefore, this is the area ideal, uh, of ideal moral solutions. Often, of course, we are stuck with a first stupid first uh, generation camera system that, um, think of the CCTV cameras in the street, that's an example that I'm using. Um, 
So a stupid first generation 1.0 camera system that gives you razor sharp images of the innocent citizens and blurred images of the crooks. Well, not very helpful, neither privacy nor security. Or you have a second generation, much better camera system, and you hang it everywhere, you have a lot of security but no privacy, or you decide not to hang it everywhere because it's so good, uh, and you have a lot of privacy but unfortunately not your privacy that you wanted. Of course what we want is a really smart camera system, the 3.0 camera system, that is so sophisticated that you can configure it in such a way, and tweak it in such a way, that, that it brings you all the advantages that the technology has to offer without the drawbacks. Right? But therefore you need an advanced technology that you can, fig can configure in, in a particular way. And that will help you to reach those areas of your ideal uh, solutions. Um, and there is many innovation along these lines. You can replace these by other conflicting values. You can see how, um, how you could try to um, kind of push this envelope more. So, so. Um, this could be done formally, and in Delft we're now working on how we could uh, kind of uh, find the matching functions and the metrics and the measurements to go with it. Um, so the lesson here is the moral axiom of, re of responsible research and innovation, my suggestion is, is, is if a contingent state of the world at a time T1 does not allow us to satisfy two or more of our moral values or moral obligations at the same time, but we can bring about change by innovation in the world at T1 that allows us to satisfy them all together at a later time T2, then we have a moral obligation to innovate at T1. Or shorter, if you can change the world by innovation today so that you can satisfy more of your obligations tomorrow, you have a moral obligation to innovate today. Um, and this may be also economically very uh, viable and very interesting. Look at what the Germans did when they, f they experienced this tension between the Green Party uh, that was wreaking havoc and chaining themselves to every factory they could find uh, and economic growth. And the rest of the world was shaking its head, you know, the Green Party is, what, what are they doing? What are the Germans doing? Um, but, uh, so economic growth and sustainability, well, Germany is market leader in sustainability technology. Why? Well, part of the story probably is, I suggest, that they had to innovate themselves out of the problem because it was squarely on the table. If they could have pretended that one horn of the dilemma wasn't there, they could have made it very easy on themselves and say, well, you know, you know, let's just go for growth. Or forget about growth and let's just go for uh, the environment. But if you have both, and you both take them serious, this is why the non-relativism is very important, you're bound very forcefully by both of those values, and they generate real moral obligations, then, yeah, and I think that the same thing may happen with the z the Atomausstieg, you know, was, let's forget about nuclear. I, th I, I think that uh, the rest of the world will come and shop for expertise and knowledge on how to decommission overnight, right? And if you have the expertise and the knowledge and the technology to do that, you're onto something really interesting. And those zero visions actually are drivers of innovation because you're making it not easy on yourself, you're making it hard on yourself. And why are you making it hard on yourself? Well, because you are morally serious. You don't want casualties. You don't want preventable deaths. You don't want children dying. And so you impose a very strict obligation on yourself to say, no, zero emissions, zero kills on the road. For example, uh, has been a, a tremendous trigger in Sweden for um, and this whole idea of zero uh, z uh, zero uh, tolerance uh, with respect to accidents in the road uh, has, for example, um, provided uh, Volvo with, with a lot of this. Uh, we don't get, Dutch Research Council doesn't get paid by Volvo, but it's, and, and it's not only, they started out with getting, protecting the driver, huh? but, and then they start to realize, oh no, but it's not only about the driver, it's also about if we make, turn the Volvo into a tank, then the pedestrians and the cyclists will be much more vulnerable. So we do this, right? We protect the, the cyclists. And uh, of course, uh, they started also to realize that all their crash dummies were men. Right? But 
we also have pregnant women, for example. So they created crash dummies and they did studies on how to protect um, pregnant women. And so they came up with solutions for that. If you're really concerned, you'll start to think about these things. Other people who are not concerned about this, who couldn't care less, who think they're all male, right? <laughs> Guys in suits driving Volvos, that they couldn't think of this. Right? So the suggestion is if you have a wider view and you, you're thinking in the world, about the world in moral terms, then you will start to think about these interesting innovations. So moral progress by innovation, transforming the world by design so that we can respect more of our obligations and responsibilities than before. Okay, so if innovation is, uh, this is a long, uh, let's just cut it short. If innovation is about introducing new functionality, you know, I put a new piece of technology into the world which allows me to do something which I couldn't do before. That's what innovation is about. Then responsible innovation is about introducing something into the world that will expand the set of obligations that I can satisfy. This is also the reason why I introduced that. I introduced this because now suddenly we can do more in terms of responsibilities and obligations. Um, so as, my, as Langdon Winner jokingly said when I met him in, uh, in, in China, uh, innovation is not about the self-parking car, you know, it, it may be about a safe car or it may be about uh, you know, a, a secure car, but not about the, f the frivolous stuff. So another, a couple of uh, historical Dutch examples. Right? Um, uh, this is a, a 17th century trading ship, it's called the Fluit, Fluitschip. Um, and uh, it has this very kind of bulky um, kind of, uh, how do you call that, hulk, or the, is that correct? Hull. hull, sorry, hull, yeah, not the hulk, that's an, something else. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, but it's, it's a huge ship, but why, and it was, it was uh, kind of developed, and, and it became, in the, in the course uh, of time, it became even more shaped like that, so a real, and, and so why is that? Well, these, these ships went to Scandinavia, and tax was levied on the square meters of the deck. Right. And the Dutch wanted to carry as much cargo as they could without paying the taxes. Right. So they started to, to kind of perfection the, 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 this. And so very small decks, but very bulky hulls. Right. So there was this value uh, carrying cargo in a safe way in a stable ship, but without the, uh, paying the taxes. Now, this is the, um, the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem. And... Um, so this is called, it's very low, and so that's the door of humility, because you have to bow, right? you bow your head. Um, the historical uh, uh, story is a little bit different, because they made it that low in order to prevent mounted horsemen to enter the church and rob and take all the, 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 the valuable uh, uh, items. Uh, so it's a safety, it's a security device. Right? Uh, this is what's happening in hospitals. Many of you are working in this, in this area. Um, my attention was drawn to this example by someone who's working at Leiden University Hospital. Um, so this is the old situation. A group of people, it's a collective uh, practice. People are standing around, they're looking at these images, uh, the kind of x-ray photos. And so it's very useful. You know, this person knows something that this person doesn't know and, and the other way around, and they correct uh, the, their, each other's. Um, diagnosis and prognosis and uh, pr proposed treatments, etc. Uh, but now this is all replaced by uh, picture archive systems, medical image systems, and um, uh, high resolution image viewers that are uh, looked at by people in isolation. So the working practice has changed. Um, it's not, it, I'm not implying that this is all wrong, but it's something that you need to take into account because you may want to introduce design features to compensate for the fact that people are now looking at these things in isolation, forming their opinion in, in isolation, and will only after the fact consult with their colleagues, which is reversal of the, the other, of the usual order of working. So the message here is, uh, with respect to value-sensitive design, values are built into systems, into technology. That, that's, that, that is what happened. And, and so I've, get, I've given some examples of how that may go wrong, or how people are undecided, or neutral, or 
Um, but of course, the message is, is that we should use this uh, structure uh, to our advantage, and that we should try to think and be articulate with respect to our values and try to use them as functional requirements to inform our designs to solve our problems that we have. Um, so this is the, the structure um, um, that uh, the, the, the founding structure of, of many of our problems in the 21st century in, in, in the age of high technology is on the one hand we think uh, these things are very important. These are ethical items more or less. You know, they, they have a, the world needs to fit and adjust itself to this. We cannot say, oh, this is, these are my values, but unfortunately the world doesn't obey them, so, you know, well, let's forget, uh, let's forget about them, right? So the world should, in principle, comply with these things here, right? So, uh, and therefore we want, to, we want to design and make and craft things here in such a way uh, that they are the expressions and implementations of our underlying values. And the other way around, uh, once we've done this and we have sunk so much money and effort into um, uh, our engineering and technology, we want to be able to explain and justify that we've done a really good job and uh, actually the best job that we could have done because other alternatives were less uh, good from a moral point of view. Right? So um, now this is all very looks, makes it uh, look very easy, but it, but it is very hard, it's very difficult because you know, you need to, um, are these worlds really separate? Everywhere where I can point my, you know, thing, there is a methodological problem or a conceptual problem. Um, so this is, uh, there's a lot of work here. It, uh, but, but I think we've captured here something which is really important. A lot of values and these things should exemplify or be the expressions of this, right? And so, but how to get there is very difficult. Believe me, if you talk to engineers at a technical university, they don't know where to start with this. They, they, they know how to work with functional requirements. If you tell them, make it that big, that sturdy, it has to be red, right? And then, then they go off and do it. But if you say, well, it has to respect uh, uh, privacy or it needs to be, oh, well, sustainability is okay, safety and security are okay. So there are some pockets where they know their way. But if it becomes more complex, then it's very hard. And especially when there are conflicts of values, then it's very difficult for them to deal with that. Um, so we need to um, learn how to design for X, where X ranges over values, moral values, as, as, as non-functional requirements designing for privacy, for security, for inclusion, for democracy, and as, as we saw in some of the examples. Now, how does this work? Well, for example, and I have had talks 10 years ago with you know, people here in the ministries who heard about the internet and wanted to do something in public administration or, you know, we need to do something with democracy and the internet. And I said, well, what do you want to do with, with, with democracy and the internet? By the way, what do you mean by democracy? Because there are, I can give you 10 different really different conceptions of democracy and depending which conception of democracy you pick, right, you will be uh, kind of oriented towards a completely different type of technology. If you think uh, of, the, in, uh, of democracy in terms of deliberation, right, then, uh, then, it's, then you will start to invest in platforms where people can meet and talk to each other. If you think about democracy in a di direct, as direct democracy, then you're starting to invest in voting technology where people can cast their votes, completely different thing. Or if you think about representation, yet another thing. Or there are people uh, talking about contestatory democracy where you give the citizens the, 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 the tools to contest the powers that be so they can protest and send emails to the, uh, you know, this, the, the, the parliament in order to you know, frustrate a certain process or kind of object to something. Um, so, and, and so the, you can then kind of follow the path a little bit and you say, well, okay, if we, if we are interested in deliberation, then probably we need to look at diversity because one of the features of this internet is that people kind of flock together and they read all the, the same stuff and, they, and, and there's a lack of diversity. Well, important for deliberations if, they, if, they, if, they're, if, 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 you, if you want interesting outcomes, then you have a, a, a minimum amount of diversity uh, that is needed. So probably you need to throw some things randomly at people so that they're, or you have to um, think about serendipity tools. These are examples. Actually, we are doing a PhD that is looking uh, at, at this. And so you can follow this even further 
uh, and see how uh, uh, eventually your idea, very abstract idea of democracy maps onto a number of features over here, which are technical features. And then you can show, you can cover, let's say this, you can say, well, you start with democracy and then step by step we're working our way towards certain technical features that we then can explain and account for in terms of plausible reasoning following them back to, you know, we started out with being interested in democracy. Okay, so uh, if we do value sensitive design, and I think that if you, if you look at responsible research and innovation under the hood of this fairly vague notion, there is value sensitive design. I think that's a very important part of it. Um, so increasing our chances of solving problems of moral overload by design. Now finally, um, to close off, something on responsibility, because that's the, the, the key concept here. Now, I'm, I'm suggesting there are two ways that, <clears throat> that you could do things, anything. One thing is, or three things, but I'm, I'm really interested in those two. Um, I, can do some, I can do something, put a, uh, a cup on the table, uh, park my car, anything, um, while at the same time increasing the chances for other people to hold me responsible for that, or I could do the opposite, decrease or limit the opportunities for you to hold me responsible with respect to it. So I could artificially limit my options, I could look away, pretend I'm ignorant, I don't want to read this, so I didn't know this. And I'm suggesting that what responsible innovation says, well, part of what it, what it implies is that you increase in thinking about your technology, in dealing with it, in doing your research and development, in, in thinking about your innovations, is you are, let's say, optimizing the conditions under which you be, be held or can be held responsible. So, so what you're doing is you're, you're reading up on the stuff. You're trying to find out as much as you can. You're trying to make an inventory of all the options that are open to you, right? If you do the opposite, then you would, then you would limit, uh, you would later, later on be able to help yourself to an excuse and say, oh, but I, I, I didn't know that I had these options, or, or, or I didn't know about that report. Uh, if I would have known about this report, then I probably would have done something else. Right? Um, so it is a matter of trying to prevent all kinds of ways out. So, oh, we didn't know what we were doing. Oh, we didn't know that it, what we were doing was wrong. I know what I was doing, but it's, this, is, this is moral ignorance, right? Or we didn't have the capability to find out. Well, you should have helped yourself to the capability to find out. Uh, or we didn't know where the options were. Or we, di we didn't have time to market. We didn't have any time, you know, the competitors were. Um, so we need to distinguish between, uh, uh, let's say, attribution and apportioning of responsibility. And many people want to get out of the responsibility game by uh, trying to help themselves to, let's say, uh, ways to get uh, um, uh, to sneak out of the, uh, the responsibility attribution at all. So that is attributing and trying to pose as, a can uh, as someone who isn't responsible at all, right? And then. If we agree that you qualify uh, and that responsibility can be attributed, you, you're into a different language game. That is namely, to what extent are you responsible? Are there valid excuses? How should it be apportioned? But the first question is, is about attribution. Um, and in order to do this well, I think we need a lot of philosophical and conceptual expertise in fine-graining our, our, our vocabulary with respect to responsibility because it it is a very misleading. I mean, it, it, it is so ambivalent. It's so ambiguous. Uh, not ambiguous, not ambivalent. Um, leads to ambivalence. But blame, liability, causality, accountability, role responsibility, tasks, monitoring, supervising, and at least this, um, what I'm really fond of and I think is very important, that is um, a responsibility of a second order of creating this, the conditions under which you yourself and other people will be responsible in these other senses of responsibility. So that is really important in um, running an organization, in running an R&D organization, or being involved in, in, in innovation uh, uh, processes. Um, have you done a good job there? This is the, the definition that we had in the report that I showed at the beginning. Uh, it's not a very snappy def definition, but I think it, it covers some of the um, crucial things. Um, 
So if some innovative organization or process or individual corporate or collective agent of innovation would be praised in virtue of their being responsible, this would imply, among other things, that those who initiated it and were involved in it must have been accommodated as moral as, as responsible agents. They must have been enabled, among other things, to obtain as much as was possible the relevant knowledge on the consequences of the outcomes of their actions, the range of options open to them. These all refer back to the criteria or the necessary conditions to hold someone uh, responsible at all, right, the, of the attribution. Or, and to evaluate both outcomes and options effectively in terms of the relevant moral values, including but not limited to well-being, justice, equality, privacy, etc. And the value-sensitive design element of that is and to use these considerations under A and B as requirements for design and development of new technology. Product service leading to moral improvement in the sense of expanding the set of obligations that you can satisfy. Now, this leads to several levels of responsible innovation. Limiting case, the simple case is, okay, I just introduce a new piece of technology or an innovation which allows me to do something that I couldn't do before. That's the simple thing. That's, that's what many engineers think. In Delft, we call them fietsen makers. Right? So <laughs> a bicycle ma maker, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I couldn't care less about the problems of the world. I'm just doing a good job. It's a nice bicycle. Right? So new functionality gets me quicker from A to B. Um, so that is mere innovation. And then one level up, is when you start to think about one value, make a safe bicycle. I'm, I'm really obsessed with making a safe bicycle. Think about the bus, right? So I want a really a sustainable bus. Make it very light, goes on liquid gas, and then I optimize over one value as, as, a, as a requirement. Unfortunately, we know what happened to the bus. It exploded because we left out the other value and so many, so many more. So, one level up from that is that, okay, we're not looking at one champion value that we happen to be very fond of and, and, and know a lot about, but we also have to think about the other values that might be relevant, right? And we have to design for them. So one level up is new functionality, but which satisfies um, you know, the requirements that are implied by a set of moral values. And then, of course, we have to think about which, you know, um, um, constraints we impose on that. Um, one level up is, uh, yet again, is if you introduce that technology and you've thought about it carefully in light of a set of values, but you take it as your aim that you solve by the introduction of that new technology or innovation, you try to solve a moral problem that we have, right? Um, one of the, the grand challenges, more or less. So that's yet another kind of higher level of doing responsible innovation. And I think, uh, coming back to the previous slide, you can do all this, as you can do anything, while trying to increase or maximize the chances or the likelihood um, that you will be held re responsible or can be held responsible uh, for what you do and what you have done. Um, so uh, I think we need to, um, to do a lot of more work, also conceptual philosophical work, and it needs to be done interdisciplinary with all um, let's say people from the, um, the, uh, humani so the humanities and the social sciences together, together with the engineers. Um, this is a never waste an opportunity to show a cute animal, a uh, picture of a cute animal. Uh, uh, so uh, responsible innovation is a little bit like a, a lazy chair. I, yesterday I heard someone talk about a responsible vaccine. Uh, well, of course, the vaccine itself isn't responsible, right? Like, like the chair itself isn't lazy, the cat is lazy. The chair invites people to be lazy, or it invites lazy people. It accommodates people who are lazy. So we should think about processes and organizations and institutions that facilitate and enhance responsible behavior by human beings in particular roles, etc. Um, I think uh, I've used up all my time. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>